Hello all, in this lesson we're going to be studying Newton's universal law of gravitation that governs um, the way planets move and all the gravitational attractions that exist between any two masses. Uh, we'll also, I'll give you a definition for gravitational field strength, which is going to be a new term for you, and we'll take a very close look at weight. This is the bookwork that's associated with the lesson. Um, and our aim, which you should write down, is how does gravity act over both long and short distances? And um, here's your do now. It's a lot of reading this time, but I do want you to name a few things that gravity does. Um, and be creative. Think about all the things that gravity are, is responsible for. And then read this paragraph. Okay, so Newton's universal law of gravitation says that everything in the universe has a gravitational field around it, that just by having mass, it's able to create an attraction to itself for other masses. And uh, Newton was able to show this using an equation that you'll see here. This equation is also on your reference table. Um, on the back page, and uh, but for now, uh, I'll just give you a short discussion of what all these things mean. Fg is gravitational force. It's often thought of as weight, and it's a force that points towards the center of mass of the object that's doing the attraction. Big G is the gravitational constant, and um, it doesn't change at any point in the universe. The value for G, big G is the same. That's what we mean by constant. Um, and you'll see its value here. It is 6.67 by 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. And then M1 and M2 are probably what you think they are. It's just mass one and mass two. And it does reference the fact that to use Newton's universal law of gravitation, you will need two masses because gravity exists between two objects. And R squared is, it is radius, but what's confusing about this is that it's really just the distance from the center of one object to the center of the other. Um, so it's you don't need to divide it in half or anything um, like the way you might get a radius from a diameter. Instead, you're just it's just the distance from the center of one object to the center of the other. Um, that's basically it uh, for the equation. We'll use this in different ways. So according to the law of gravitation, the force that it, M1 exerts on M2 is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the one that M2 exerts on M1. This is essentially a restatement of Newton's third law. And um, there are some really cool algebraic effects that you can check out with um, when we alter distance, when we alter one of the masses, and I'll give you some practice on that now. So let's say that I do double one of the masses. I'll just put in a two here, and then you can see because of the direct relationship between M1 and Fg, you should be able to see that you would end up doubling Fg, or you would double the gravitational force. If I were to double both masses, then um, you would get that same direct relationship um, but for both masses in Fg, but it would be sort of two times two. So you would get a quadrupling in this case of, the, of Fg. And interestingly, if I were at the same time to double the radius, you would have another effect. The radius has an inverse square relationship with Fg, which means that everything you do to the radius um, inversely affects Fg by its square. So... In other words, if I take this 2 and square it, so it's 2 squared, that's a 4, right? So, But it's a 4 in the denominator. So that means that the effect that it would have on Fg would be 1 fourth. That's the inverse square rule. Now, 1 fourth of 4 actually is 1. They cancel each other out, the two 4s in the numerator and the denominator. So if I were to double one mass, double the other mass, and double the radius, I would actually get the exact same Fg, um, which I think is an interesting and sort of cool algebraic effect. 
All right, I have a sample problem for you that will utilize Newton's gravitational law. I want you to calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force of attraction that the Earth exerts on the moon. I will tell you that the mass of Earth you can find on the front page of your reference table, if I'm not mistaken. Same thing for the mass of the moon. And you will also need, aside from m1 and m2, mass of Earth, mass of moon, you will also need the radius or the distance between the Earth and the moon. I believe on your reference table it's on the front page and it would be called mean distance from Earth to moon or average distance from Earth to moon. So um, find those values and also your value for g, which is also on the front page of your reference table, and um, plug them all in and find me a value for fg in newtons. Um, the video will pause and you'll be able to select an answer from multiple choice. So I have pulled values from the reference table. I have 6.67 by 10 to the negative 11 for Newton's uh, gravitational constant. I have 5.98 by 10 to the 24 for the mass of the Earth, 7.35 by 10 to the 22 for the mass of the Moon, and the radius or the mean distance Earth to Moon is 3.84 by 10 to the 8th, and you do need to remember to square that value. So with all these exponents, I really suggest using the strategy I taught you where you separate the coefficient or multiplier from the exponents and do them in separate steps. I'll show you what I mean by that next. So I did separate it into pieces for you. Um, here I just have the just the multiplier for each of the four values, and I took out their exponents. You will need to square this 3.84, by the way. It, 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 the square is for the multiplier and the exponent. Um, and then I used the exponent trick, so I just did times 10 to the, and then the exponent for that 10 you can solve that by uh, basically summing all of the exponents on the top and subtracting the exponents in the denominator. And so you'll see a negative 11 plus 24 plus 22. That's the stuff from the numerators. But then I have minus 16, which may throw some people for a loop, but when you square an exponent that already exists, the thing you should do is multiply them together. So it will be 2 by 8 rather than, let's say, 8 squared. Um, so 2 by 8 is 16, and I did minus 16 because it's in the denominator. So that's um, all the setup I'm going to give you. The video is going to pause now, and you need to select your answer choice from there before it'll continue. So just a note here, um, when I did the multipliers by themselves, I got 19.88. Um, um, and when I did the exponents by themselves, I got 19. So this isn't proper form for scientific notation, so I changed it to this form. Um, and I always get confused about whether I'm moving the decimal left or right. So um, one of the things I do is I just take this and I type it into a calculator and then just press enter. And the calculator will, no matter which one you have, will always spit it back out in a proper scientific notation. So that's a trick that I suggest using. So gravitational field strength is, um, it, it actually is the same thing as acceleration due to gravity. They have different units. But basically, um, the gravitational fields are these areas around masses where the, their gravity exists. And it's not the same strength at all points in the field. Um, you can tell by these diagrams and the spacing of the lines that the gravitational field is weakest farther away from the planet because you can see that the lines are more spaced out from each other, and that's indicating that the field is not as strong. But once you get down here, the lines are very close together. And that is a visual indication of the strength of the field. Um, gravitational fields are always towards the center of objects. It's just an interesting fact. And the major difference here between the two diagrams that are really showing the same thing is that uh, diagram A is showing the vectors as being separate and distinct from one another. So it's saying this is the acceleration at this point, and then the acceleration is larger at this point, which makes sense because you're getting closer to the planet um, and the acceleration would be larger as a result. Um, what they've done in the second diagram is they've connected them 
all in one into a continuous line. But what I'm asking you in this next conceptual question is, why do you think it is that this line is shorter than this one? Um, you'll be able to choose a multiple choice explanation. So when we do calculations with gravitational field strength, you'll get to use this handsome equation. It only has three terms, which is lovely. And I'm going to show you something pretty cool about it, which is that it has the exact same structure as the equation A equals F net over M. Um, that's not a coincidence. F net is analogous here to FG, and which is weight. And A is analogous here to G. But the thing that's really cool is that actually A and G are both accelerations. G is the acceleration due to gravity, and A is just general acceleration. And FG is gravitational force, and then F net would be just general force. So I think what's interesting about these two is that they're actually both the same equation. This one has just been tailored to fit uh, gravity, que gravity questions better. And um, this is the equation that you would use to measure gravitational field strength as well as acceleration due to gravity, because they literally will have the exact same value. Um, if you need any further proof on that, I'm going to show you some dimensional analysis right now. So basically, if, if g is fg over m, I'm going to put in a unit for fg, and that's going to be newtons, and m is kilograms. And if I do the same thing for the general equation for a is f net over m, the unit for f net is also newtons, and the unit for m is also kilograms. So in both cases, you're getting newtons per kilogram, and that is an appropriate unit for gravitational field strength. It's much better than using meters per second squared. I have one more note for you on this slide. Just do not confuse little g, gravitational field strength or acceleration due to gravity, with big G. They actually are very different numbers, um, and it would definitely get in the way of cor getting correct answers for equations if you were to mix them up. All right, weight. Weight is what happens when mass interacts with gravity. We can use this equation to measure weight. It just says Fg equals Mg, and it looks very similar to F equals Ma, because it actually is the same equation. But instead of normal, just general F, we're using Fg, gravitational force. Instead of generalized acceleration, we're using little g, acceleration due to gravity. But this is the equation that you always use to measure weight of an object. And it also highlights the difference, even between chemistry and physics, of the difference between mass and weight. Um, in chemistry, oftentimes, you'll be asked, how much does this weigh? And you'll answer it in grams. But in physics, we can see that that's no longer appropriate. Because when I ask you how much something weighs, I'm asking you to report a force which means that it always must be measured in newtons, um, not kilograms. All right, so let's do this one question here. What is the weight of a one kilogram object on Earth, and what would its weight be on the moon? So on Earth, we would just use the equation Fg equals mg, and it's really convenient because we already know the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. And its mass is 1 kilogram, so I'll put 1 for m. And gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared, which means that its weight is not 1 kilogram. Its weight is 9.81 newtons. So that's my answer for Earth. Now, on the moon, there's a little, there's some more complicated math here because I don't know what the acceleration on the moon is right away, and it's not on my reference table. So... In this case, I suggest not using the simplified version for Fg equals Mg. Instead, I recommend using an equation that will always work, no matter where you are in the universe, and that's Newton's universal law for gravitation. In other words, Fg equals big G m1 m2 over r squared. Um, what you'll need to do to get this question right is 
use big G, the value for big G. M1 can be the mass of the moon, so you'll look that up on your reference table. M2 will be this one kilogram mass, and R squared will be the radius of the moon, which is on your reference table. So radius of moon, one, mass of moon, and the universal gravitational constant. So look those values up, um, find your answer, and you'll be presented with the multiple choice response after the break. So I did a lot of math, but I was able to find uh, here the universal gravitational constant, and this is the mass of the moon, and there's my one for the mass of the object. And my radius was 1.74 by 10 to the 6. That's the radius of the moon, and I squared it. I did separate those values, so I just did 6.67 by 7.35 divided by the square of 1.74, and I got 16.19. And then I did negative 11 plus 22 minus 12, and that got me negative 1. And then I recombined it, and I got 1.619 newtons, which is roughly one-eighth of the value 9.81. And that's true because uh, the value, the gravity on the moon is, I think I said one-eighth, but it's actually, I believe, one-sixth the value of the acceleration on Earth. All right, wait. Um, you can also judge this based on a graph. So on the y-axis, we have weight in newtons. And on the x-axis, we have mass in kilograms. I want you to think about what the slope of this particular graph could possibly mean, and um, you'll be able to select a multiple choice answer for this question. So slope, as you may know, is change in y over change in x. So it's going to be newtons over kilograms in that case, and so you could answer it as gravitational field strength or acceleration. The Earth and the Moon on this graph have two different slopes. Earth's is a lot larger and the Moon's is a lot narrower, and the reason is because the gravitational field strength on the Moon is a lot lower than that of Earth. So that's why the slope of the Moon is lower than the slope for Earth. Um, this is a diagram that I think is kind of funny, but it's just showing that your weight is very different on depending on what planet that you're on, because your weight is the interaction between your mass and gravity, and depending on what planet you're on, gravity can be very different. So your weight is the most on the sun, and uh, the least on the moon of all these diagrams. But one thing that I do think is worth noting is that your mass is the same at all points. That's an interesting thing that does come up in regions questions is that your mass is the same at all points in the universe. This graph is an inverse square graph and it's really just demonstrating Newton's um, universal law of gravitation which is that Fg equals big G m1 m2 over r squared and this is also um, it shows inverse square as well especially between the radius and the gravitational field strength. So that's why you're showing as distance increases along this x-axis, the gravitational force is decreasing by an inverse square. Um, this is the idea of weight in an elevator. Um, what I would stress on this slide, and I think it's the most time-efficient way to deal with this, is that um, when you're going up in an elevator, you often feel pressed to the floor um, as if you weigh more all of a sudden. And when you go down in an elevator, down in an elevator, you sometimes feel lighter than um, what you normally feel. And that's because of the acceleration of the elevator. As it accelerates upward, your weight is going to feel more. And if the elevator accelerates downward, your weight will feel less. So we finally reached the pair up. I will make a copy of these for you, but you can take a glance at them now, preview them. Maybe you'll have answers for them later. More pair up. 
and summary. I do want you to copy down these summary questions on your own notebook paper to prepare for class. Thank you for watching and have a great evening.